Okay. Um, hi, Matthew. Thank you so much for oh. helping my project. Um, could you say a little bit about yourself? Well, I was eight years old when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. So space has always been an area of fascination for me. And space was also, in a way, how I got into my career because the technological push in the 60s led to the rise of personal computers, which is how I got into technical writing as a career. And I'm a novelist. I've written four novels. My two most recent novels, Amiga and The Remainders, were published by Black Rose Writing. And I have a nonfiction book on public speaking called Mastering Table Topics. Um, mastering Table Topics, uh, you, would you by a chance be in Toastmasters? I was in Toastmasters for 17 years. I was, uh, I got into it through my job and I was really involved with it. I've won a number of speech contests. I also was an area governor and I reached the rank of D Distinguished Toastmaster, which is their highest level in that organization. So I gained a lot from it. And what's great about table topics is being able to come up with a good impromptu speech about the two or three minutes, which really helped me in, in producing TikTok videos because they're up that, to that length, so. Yeah, you mentioned Apollo 11 um, happened when you were eight years old. I have trouble remembering stuff from my childhood, but I'm wondering, do you have any memories of that actual event? Well, I also have memories of the years leading up to it, when I was a little boy, it seemed like space was our main area of fascination. And I had lots of space toys. I had the <clears throat> GI Joe astronaut with the Mercury capsule. And uh, I had a set of space play characters called Major Matt Mason. My dad and I built a four foot tall model of the Saturn V rocket. And of course we had our science fiction television shows and movies like Star Trek and Lost in Space. And then we, even our food was centered around space because we drank Tang because that's what the astronauts drank. And we had these little chocolate snacks called astronaut or something with the astronauts because it looked like the type of food that astronauts ate out of a tube in those old uh, Apollo missions. So space was really important to all of us. So when Apollo 11 happened, it's like Christmas, how through the whole month of December, you you're, the excitement just builds up until Christmas day and you go down to the tree and all the presents are there. And that was the feeling we had with Apollo because over the decade, we were building up this excitement about landing on the moon and then it finally happened. And my memories of it was, it was it, the, the, the first uh, moonwalk was around, I think about 10.30 PM Pacific time. And we stayed up, you know, my parents slept, my brother and I stay up and we gathered around the huge cabinet TV and we watched Neil Armstrong take its first steps on the moon. And it was just one of those, you'll always remember where you were when, you know, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Oh, why? Did you have this excitement about it? I mean, like, what what did you perceive as being the significance of this event? Because we understood that this was a great human achievement. It was an achievement that we as a nation had committed to. Because we all heard the you know, John F. Kennedy speech that we should commit ourselves to landing a man on the moon and returning them safely to earth. So it's the idea of setting a great goal and achieving it. And the fact that, you know, where, where I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, space was a really big 
part of our economy as well because we had Rocketdyne just a few miles from us. They were testing uh, rocket engines in Simi Valley and sometimes we can hear the rumble from them. So it was this great national community event where everybody pitched in and we achieved this great goal together. Yeah, I, I mean, events like that where, you know, there's like a, a, a lot of effort by a large group of people and it actually happens. I, I can see how that's important. Um, I'm wondering, is there anything that you see going on today that would be of the same type of significance as um, Apollo and uh, landing on the moon? You know, I, I wish there were. I wish there was a sense of the, of something that could bring our nation together. I, I think maybe the closest thing we have is, are the Olympics or some other international sporting event where we're all rooting behind Team USA. But even in then, the, you'll have these groups that will nitpick and they'll say, well, I don't like this athlete because this is a person is from the LGBTQ community, or I don't like this person because of their political statements. So even in something that's supposed to be this great national unity event like sports, you could see the fissures that go on in society. Yeah, absolutely. Um, going back to Apollo 11 and being eight, um, did you get I mean, what did you think this was leading up to? What were your expectations uh, after landing on the moon? We all felt, and again, this was inspired by science fiction uh, because we all thought, okay, the moon was the first step. From the moon, we were gonna go build these huge space stations where people could live in space. And then we were going to go to Mars. And then we were going to go beyond the solar system. We didn't even, we figured that any technological or limitation of physics like faster than light speed, which we don't have a even scientific uh, fix for, and there may not be one, but we believe that once we've accomplished this, that anything else is possible. And so we looked at like television series like Star Trek, and I still favor Star Trek as my over Star Wars because it is an aspirational television series. It's the idea that whatever problems or faults humanity has, we'll be able to overcome them and we can go out and explore the stars. So there was this great feel of possibility that I wish we had more of today. Uh, okay, so you remember Apollo 11 landing. Do you remember watching your first Star Trek episode? I didn't get that much into Star Trek until the 70s because then it was in syndication. And what I love about Star Trek is that the idea of people coming together and and this was in the 60s, the idea that like, for example, we're you know, we all remember uh, Nichelle Nichols, who played uh, Lieutenant Uhura. So the idea that a Black woman could be on the spaceship and working with all these different people of all these different uh, planets and societies and work together and it was just a wonderful image. And then when you, in later iterations of Star Trek, you see sometimes humanities and the Federation's biggest enemies like the, like the Klingons. They were the big bad or one of the big bads of the original series. But in the next generation, you have Lieutenant Worf who is a Klingon and he's on the bridge and he's able to be a part of this adventure with everybody else. So it, it paints a, not just a, a greater image of humanity, but it, it sets this aspiration of this is what we can be as a people, as a society. I definitely, and you know, while we're on the topic of uh, Star Trek, I feel like 
uh, Star Trek was a unique cultural phenomenon that I don't see being repeated in the sense of having uh, this futuristic, um, like you said, coming together view of humanity. Um, and that was kind of provided this, this common vision of a future we could work towards. And even if you didn't know or watch Star Trek, you were still aware of it and were familiar with it. You, you still shared the same language, but mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like we have anything that uh, has filled in uh, that place in, in modern culture. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on, on that. Well, as an author, I'm aware of, for example, not only the role that social trends play on our, uh, on our fiction, but the way fiction can help shape those uh, social trends. And I think that one of the things that, uh, that does make it more challenging now is that we are so fractured in our entertainment that we have all these specific niches of not just entertainment, but even with news that people latch on to whatever reflects their point of view. And we don't have anything that's sort of this big collective, uh, you know, message. Like, for example, when I was a kid, there were only three major television networks and maybe a few smaller channels and UHF. So you, so everybody saw the same thing, like even with Watergate, everybody saw the, the same news, everybody got the same facts and we could all draw and people had different opinions and drew different conclusions, but we all worked on the same set of facts and ideas. But now today, media is so fragmented and so, and so much caters to people's particular beliefs that there isn't a agreed upon collective and shared experience of, of media of, of, uh, or even of news that you pick the things that you like and that reinforce your worldview and there's no shared uh, worldview. But I think maybe the thing that might have come close to that in recent years is the Harry Potter franchise, because it was such a global phenomenon and was such good, was so great at the time for world building. And I know that a lot of kids like my daughter who grew up in the 90s and 2000s with the Harry Potter books and movies were part of the shared community that was fairly broad reach. And of course, the sad thing is even Harry Potter today, it, that image is sort of crumbling based on, first of all, people's analysis of the works of the author and some of the things that the author has done and said since then. So it's become really hard in today's culture to have a collective and shared experience but we as you know creative people as authors as musicians as movie makers we also have the ability to help shape that future if we just have to find the, the right thing that can resonate with the largest number of people and we can start changing the narrative in that case yeah we definitely have a culture of um pulling down statues, anything that looks like it's, it's meant to be revered needs to, we need to find its defects and pull it down in some respect. Yeah. And that could be a good thing too. They have, you know, sometimes people do revere the wrong things and so we do have to look critically at things, but the danger that we run into is cynicism. And again, I was thinking about the transition from the 60s to the 70s when I was a teenager, because a lot of Star Trek and the Apollo program, they were built from the optimism of the 60s. And the 60s were a dangerous time, but they were also informed with the idea of hope that humanity can grow and develop. And all of that got undermined in the 70s because we saw the limits of that. 
you know, with Vietnam and Watergate and the economy, uh, you know, lagging and the oil crises. And so our work became a lot more, so the, the art of the time became a lot more cynical. And I think it was 19, in, in the mid seventies, there was a movie called Capricorn One. Mm -hmm. uh, it starred OJ Simpson in it. So I remember, remember that and some other stars. And it was the idea that the, the United States was going to launch people into Mars and that for whatever reason, the Mars mission couldn't happen. So what they, and NASA wanted to cover it up. So what happened was they, basically recreated the Mars walk, the, the you know, landing on a soundstage. And then they had to get rid of the astronauts so they didn't wake the truth. And I think a lot of these conspiracy theories about, oh, the moon landing was faked, either you know, sort of came up with that sort of thing. So we, we don't trust any, anything anymore. So that's the the danger of you could be overly optimistic and make horrible mistakes like we made and you know going into Vietnam but then you could fall to the other end of cynicism where nothing where and that could be a mistake too where you don't trust anything and you don't aspire to be anything and you just let whoever tells you what you want to hear to dictate what you want to, what uh, what you should believe yeah, and I mean, the ultimate is uh, the flat earthers, you know, uh, in the sense that uh, there, there must be some grand conspiracy out there to convince us all that the world is round. And uh, we have all this, this, you know, complete rejection of anything, any any thought and observation to, to believe a particular point. It's uh, kind of interesting. Yeah. It's interesting about flat Earth because I think at some point it was starting it started as sort of like a way of trolling, like oh we're going to troll the normies, we're going to make this big joke. But then the danger is is that people have created this whole mythology to justify this, and we've known that the Earth is round from the days of ancient Greece. I think it's been three thousand years. Christopher Columbus knew the world was round. Nobody in his time knew, assumed the world was flat, you know, but the, the problem with Columbus was he miscalculated the size of the earth among other things as the historical record shows. But it's at the point now where you make up your own facts and you can find a group of people who share them. And we can look at the election of 2020 as an example that people just don't believe that, you know, you know, it turned out the way that it did. And so there's even people who are still litigating the 2020 election because they just can't, you know, when you don't like the facts, you change the facts. That's, that's the way people are. It's, today yeah we have a term at work uh, obe overcome by events i i yeah. think uh that some being aware of whenever uh, uh something's become obe is important yeah fun um well you know harry potter i didn't think about that as being like a kind of a cultural phenomenon that may have been at the same scale and scope as star trek i think you're right. Uh, it would be hard to find somebody that was not at least aware of Harry Potter. But it's kind of interesting yeah. comparing Star Trek and science fiction with Harry Potter and fantasy, as well as maybe all these vampire uh, kind of uh, movies and, and books that have come out. Um, and you kind of distill down uh, some key aspects of them. Uh, I wonder if, if this maybe speaks to our culture Back in the, the 60s and 70s, we thought we could figure out the world and could actually make it a better place and can shape it using thought and science. Whereas Harry Potter and these vampire movies basically com completely reject that idea and say that there are forces outside of our control that uh, affect us, that certain lucky people can uh, can, can manipulate and are aware of, um, and it's really not so much of, of using thought and uh, engineering, if you will. And I was wondering what your take was on that analysis. 
Well, what's really strange about it is that at the same time, human thought and analysis and innovation has gotten to the point where, where we've even exceeded in many areas the what we believe was possible in the 60s. You look at Star Trek's flip communicator that uh, Kirk and his crew used in the original series. That was considered state of the art in the 60s, like this is futuristic. But you know, today, if you have a flip phone, you're considered an old timer. You know, we have smartphones that far exceed what, what com- even what computers could do five years ago. But the difference is, is that these have become everyday objects. These are things that we use and depend upon all the time. And there are people who tweet or post about how evil technology is and it will take over the world on a, and how the government's monitoring everything we do on a smartphone that has, uses artificial intelligence and can track every motion we make. So the problem is, is that we've come to take technology for granted. And even with space missions today, they become so commonplace that we don't even think about them. We're seeing some amazing images, for example, from the James Webb telescope and our collective response, it's all, oh, that's nice. So, so we tend to take technology for granted. And with the, in some respects, the technology has become uh, a lot more uh, difficult to understand and relate to and may feel like magic and kind of like uh, spiritual forces, uh, you know, contriving to either support us or, or to, to challenge us. Well, I don't know if it's so much that we don't understand it, but it's not necessary to understand it. Like when, again, looking at smartphones, I remember I've been with it in the computer industry from the early days of the personal computer market. So I understand the difference between a CPU and a video display and a display monitor and storage and and mice because they were all separate devices, separate things that sat on my desk in front of us. You pick up a smartphone today, it's this bar, you turn this glass covered bar, you turn it on, it works. It does what you tell it to do and we don't think about it. So it's the magic of technology is gone. It's so, they just are, we expect things to work. And the only time we really think about the technology is when it doesn't work. And then that's it becomes true. an inconvenience and a bother. That's, that's definitely true. I, so you were eight during Apollo 11. That would make you about 11 or 12 during Apollo 17. Um, yeah. When Apollo 17 splashed down, and that was the end of the Apollo trips to the moon, Oh, did you, I mean, did that really sink in uh, for you? Or, I mean, what were you thinking at that time? Well, by the time the last Apollo mission landed on the moon, it was something we didn't think about that much. By that, again, the first time with Apollo 11, it's like, wow, this is exciting. This is great. Apollo 12, yeah, that's interesting. Apollo 13 certainly caught the nation's attention because it was a near disaster. But in subsequent missions, the attention sort of waned. We got used to it. So Apollo 17 was sort of like, okay, we did that. We're done. Well, what's the next thing? So a lot a lot of attention was paid to, well, not as much as with Skylab, but also that my life was changing because I was getting older. Uh, my parents were start were going through a divorce, and also it's getting in my early pubescent era. So, space exploration for me personally wasn't as interesting. It wasn't as uh, compelling. So, Apollo seventeen to me was anticlimactic. 
Um, did you still have the hope at that point that we would still expand humanity beyond the earth or did it kind of um, the realities of of the end of the Apollo program and growing up and becoming more interested in and maybe you know schooling and career and life uh, I mean at what point did, did maybe those those visions of humanity going beyond the earth kind of settle back down I mean how was how was that I think it was around that time that space exploration became less important um, to me. Um, and of course, I think the, by then, you know, things here on earth, problems here on earth became more front and center and challenges my own life as a, as a you know, growing up, being a teenager, going through normal teenage stuff. So space, exploration became sort of like um, I lost interest in it. and I was more interested in computers because that was the new and exciting thing and these were things that I could actually work with and use so that part of so that became uh, an area of interest um, and could you uh, tell me about your career in computers uh, did you start out as a programmer or, or something else well, I start, my first experience actually went back in 1970 because I was in a gifted class and we took a tour of the UCLA computer lab. And of course, back then where there were mainframes and they even gave us this thing called, uh, I don't know now the name of it escapes me, the sort of cardboard computer simulator, which mm -hmm. talks about the basics of com computer processing. And, and then in uh, the 80s, I got my first, uh, I've always wanted to be a writer, but I needed to find a job that, you, that, that I can make a living as a writer. Certainly it's very hard to make a living writing books, as a, but uh, I got a job as an intern at a small Commodore software Computer software company called Entech, and I started off writing press releases, but then wound up writing everything that needed to be done, uh, that needed to be put into print, including user manuals, and that's how I got started in, in my technical writing career. So I started off with the Commodore 64, and then stayed with Commodore computers. I uh, got the Commodore Amiga when it came out, and. That was the inspiration for my novel Amiga. And then when Commodore, and then I got a job at AST, which is a PC software computer company. And so I switched to the PC. So I've been in the computer industry for almost uh, 40 years. That is, uh, that's amazing. My first computer is actually a Commodore VIC-20, so. Yeah. Uh, so now moving kind of more into the present time, uh, when did um, our uh, plans to go back to the moon with Artemis kind of come to your attention? Well, I think that, you know, we've all heard the stories about space exploration or, you know, Americans getting back into space exploration. And since the end of the shuttle program in 2011, and you know we all saw these uh, little billionaire joy rides with spacex and uh with blue origin and stuff like that but uh the idea that but then i think it around a few years ago i started hearing about artemis and the idea that we were going to go back to land on the moon which i really think that to a great extent that uh, we stopped exploring the moon too soon there's a lot more that we haven't uncovered. So the idea that we would be going back to the moon, maybe even starting up like a lunar station, that's all really exciting. Uh, and do you think this, I mean, I guess what, what makes it exciting and important, if you were to talk to a person on the, the street about um, why we should do this, how, what are some things that you would, would bring up? 
Well, I would go back to some of the, the talking points when we landed on the moon in the first place in the 60s, because we had a lot of these debates, like, why are we wasting all this money on the space program when we had bigger problems here on Earth? And the fact is, is that the space program was a, was a source of innovation. It, uh, a lot of the technologies that we enjoy today came out of the space program. And by going back to the moon through the technical and the technological innovations that can come from landing on the moon and establishing a lunar base and can we can gain a lot out of it through a lot of benefits here on earth you know who knows what technologies we can develop what can we learn about medicine how can we apply what we learn from lunar landings to help life on earth because we've definitely shown the benefits of space exploration uh, for humanity so i think that those are all things that we should encourage uh, now, whenever you look at the future of humanity, say 200 years, um, do you think we're still just on the Earth making these little short trips to places like uh, low Earth orbit and the moon? Or do you think we've fundamentally been able to enable uh, groups of people to live off of the Earth and humanity is actually spreading out more throughout the solar system? Well, I think before we talk about 200 years in the future, we've got to get through the immediate problems that we have right now. We are, we have a number of serious existential crises right now. And if you look back at the story, uh, the you know the the story world of Star Trek, they talk about it that in the Star Trek universe, this is the century where all the bad stuff happened and. Humanity had to survive those, like the, I was watching a uh, episode of the new Strange New World series, and they recapped sort of these events of the early 20th century that human, in their fictional world that humanity had to get through and included the Civil War, a second, the Second Civil War, and they show clips of January 6th in that part. And then they talked about uh, the eugenics war, which was part of their canon, and finally World War III, where 30% of humanity was, was wiped out. So the idea is, is that we have to get through the immediate existential crises we have now. And once we get through those things and can regain, rebuild a, a stronger humanity, then it becomes of what can we realistically do given the laws of physics and what we know about science. I just wonder though, if we'll always have the sense of having existential, existential problems. Uh, I mean, because if you look at some of the events of the past, you know, the, um, the plutonic plagues that, you know, kind of ravaged Europe, um, World War I, World War II, you know, the nuclear standoff, um, and, you know, the, the Spanish flu, you know, a, a whole bunch of, of other problems. I'm sure at the time that those problems felt like they were uh, potentially world uh, shattering as well, and they don't carry quite the same emotional punch for us today because we know how it turned out. And is it really that our, our problems have really become so much bigger or is it just that we're living through them and we don't know what, how they're gonna turn out? Well, well, it's true, we live in history and I'm sure that maybe a hundred years from now, people will look back at our time and say exactly the same thing that you have said. The biggest, and again, I think maybe the clue is what we went through in the 60s, because our existential crisis was nuclear war, that the United States and the former Soviet Union had amassed such large nuclear arsenals that we could have wiped out humanity at any point. And in fact, in 1962, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, we came as close as we ever have to that type of war happening. And I think the, 
the 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 big ex I mean the big existential question is it's always are we going to learn to live together or are we going to die together and that's the question that we as humanity have to struggle with and I think maybe the way of having hope for the future having the belief that we can get through whatever we're going through at this moment and grow as a species that we can get past this moment there's something beyond there that's worth surviving for i think that's really and and this is where science fiction this is where science and technology uh can really put us through you know get us through you know i was thinking about and i could send you a link to it but i did an article back in 2014 about cosmos series and Inherit the Wind, which was the movie, the fictionalized version of the Scopes uh, evolution trial. And there's a struggle, you know, the thing that science offers us is hope and, um, and the willingness to explore and to discover. And I think, and it, this is compared to believing in superstition, giving into fear, distrusting the unknown, distrusting the stranger, people who are different from us. And I, I think that's the, this is where science and technology and art can come together to help overcome those elements of fear and superstition and hatred. So I think that, you know, yes, we're always going to face existential crises, but hope and science and, and, and creativity and empathy, those are the things that are gonna get us through existential crises, whatever they are. Yeah, and uh, hope seems to be uh, uh, severely challenged in, in today's culture. Yeah, I think people get so invested in fear that we, we and, and I think in some cases people don't really understand what fear is. You know, people will you know, like when they when you during the pandemic where people wore masks and you'd have certain people say, "Well, I'm not going to live in fear," but you don't understand that when you take care, do steps to take care of yourself and protect yourself and others, that's not fear. That's, you know, common sense, that's empathy, that's caring for yourself and caring for others. And the thing, and people aren't afraid of the things that are really fearful, like climate change and in terms of, you know, political divisiveness. So- Absolutely. I, and the complete disconnect uh, between the people with their communities and each other. Yes. Uh, so if you could, would you take a trip to space? I, I think at this point in my life, I, you know, I don't, cause I know space flight is a very de physically demanding uh, thing. And in my age, that's, it's not really advisable. But I think that space should be something that you know, it's a it's a thing for young people because for two reasons, not just the physical capabilities, but also I think that it's important to inspire our young people the way that I was inspired as a child. And having people that they can relate to. And, and I hope that when we look at who to send it onto the moon, that we include teachers, that we include, you know, artists and musicians and poets, people who can humanize the experience and bring it back to earth and share it and, and give and share that with uh, the rest of humanity. Because yeah, I think that... Because I think the thing that's, that we really need is the way to break through a lot of these silos of distrust is 
to is human connection. And that's one thing we've lost during the pandemic, especially when we've all had to be isolated is a sense of human connection. And if we focus on humanizing space, you know, showing what it can offer us, well, the hope that it can provide us, the wonder that it provides, it gives us the perspective, I think that that will further humanity's willingness to explore. And we can start dipping our toes out of away from the immediate shore of of space and we can look at exploring you know the you know further out in our solar system and exploring what might lie beyond our uh, solar system yeah it's interesting you mentioned uh sending artists uh, sometimes we send people and they become artists i'm thinking of like alan bean the apollo 12 astronaut who's also yeah. a Skylab astronaut and had the opportunity to be a shuttle astronaut, but uh, realized that being able to communicate through his art, his experiences was actually something he uniquely could do that um, uh, and other people could just as easily serve as a shuttle astronaut. So I thought that was yeah. interesting. And then I don't know if you've heard of a project called Dear Moon. Uh, no, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, it's this uh, Japanese billionaire is paying SpaceX to send um, about a dozen artists around the moon um, to, with the idea that they would, um, uh, you know, and, and he's, he's talking about artists in the most general sense, uh, film directors, uh, writers, um, fashion designers, uh, music mm -hmm. people, uh, with the idea they would be able to have this experience and be able to communicate it at a level uh, that's really difficult uh, for for people about that background to communicate at. Yeah, I think that would be a wonderful program. And the more that we can involve people, uh, one of the things that I also remember as a child is when they brought the moon rocks back from Apollo Eleven, that they went on a nationwide tour at all the various uh, museums across the country. And being able to look at a piece of moon rock, you know, something from hundreds of thousands of miles away from Earth, something that was floating out in space, and making that type of personal connection is that's a that's a powerful experience because again, that's how you shatter a lot of these you know, people who make up all these conspiracy theories. You set the truth right in front of them. You give them an opportunity to interact with things in a personal level. And then that's how you break the spell. Because, you know, how can you deny something that's right in front of you that you can look at, that you're in the presence of, it, it, you know, it's that that's something that can sh 